Yo, what's up, family? Welcome to another episode of the Keys to Black Consciousness podcast. I am Asad Malik, and this podcast is brought to you by the Pan African Alliance, panafricanalliance.com, where we give you education for liberation on health, wealth, and knowledge of self. And as is tradition around here, before we get into today's episode, let me greet you as I always do with peace. To my brothers and sisters in Islam, let me say assalamu alaikum. Let me say black power to the Panthers, both new and true. Honors to the Moors and Shalom to the Hebrew faithful. Hotep to the Kemites and God bless all the Christians listening. And finally, Hamjam Boni, Karibu, and welcome Gina Langu Niasad Malik. That is Kiswahili, the language of the black and conscious community. And I always start my podcasts and events off with that greeting to remind you that we don't have to be uniformed in our belief or our background to be unified in our intentions as long as that is the liberation and salvation of the black nation and if you are new here let me break down how we flow and glow how we do business how we get down we always start off with shout outs then we get into some reader listener emails uh typically we also do a do the knowledge segment but i'm going to tie this reader listener email into our do the knowledge segment so stay tuned for that you'll always learn something from these reader listener emails then we take a short media break this media break comes from you all so Put me on to your black conscious artists, your spoken word poets, your beat makers, your rappers, your singers, anybody out there in the community doing anything uh, that you feel like uh, is raising the vibration. And I'll put them on. Right. And then we roll out the red, black and green carpet. Today it is for uh, a beautiful, beautiful sister, Ray Queen. She's going to be dropping the secret for sisters and all black folks. So you all want to stay tuned for that. Let's get into today's episode. First and foremost, shout outs, shout outs, Uh, special shout outs go to Shanice, Kwame, Frank, Marquise, Andrew, Tadesha, Crystal, Chester and Josephine. These are our most recent supporters. All right. These are our most recent supporters. They're the reason why you're getting this podcast for free. We need about a thousand members. And here's what we're doing with those members and all this membership revenue. First of all, I understand that you can't participate fully in this movement if your financial needs are not being met. I understand that the vast majority of y'all are ready to sock your boss upside their head and get off the plantation because that'll set you up for more free time. That will give you more time with your family. It'll give you more financial security. It'll give you something that you can pass down to future generations. It'll give you the type of work that aligns with your life mission. So you're ready to get off the plantation and you need resources that help you achieve that. So what I wanna do with this membership program is lower the cost of you setting up a business all the way down to zero. Starting with online assets, how am I gonna do that? Okay, so think about what it costs to set up a business, right? Think about all those costs. Online, I'm talking strictly online. Setting up a website, that costs you money, right? Buying your domain name, that costs you money. And then you need that website designed, that costs you a lot of money, right? Um, You need a way to ship products, you need a fulfillment system, you need advice, support, guidance, right? You need all these things to get set up. Well, all that costs approximately zero dollars if you become a member and take advantage of our Black Business Builder tools. So here's what we offer you. 900,000 web assets. This includes a a, a website design. If you need pamphlets designed, flyers, you get access to that. High quality stock footage. Uh, I'm talking about video, photography, audio, whatever it is that you need, you get access to all of that. Uh, When we're talking about video marketing, you get access to some dope tools to make video intros and add effects to your videos, make them stand out from the competition. You get access to that. Uh, PDFs that walk you through step by step, you get access to that. So if that's the path that you're on, I am lowering the cost of you starting up a business to zero. The more members we get, the more assets I can bring to you. The next asset that I'm about to bring to you is an entire team of virtual assistants. This is the same team I use to set up my real estate business. All right. And so what this will give you is 24 hour a day, seven day a week access to people who will set your website up for you, uh, create graphics for you, uh, do research for you. The cost of you setting up your black business has dropped to zero. We do free website hosting. Actually, no, you got to pay 99 cents for your domain name. Go to panafricanlines.com forward slash 99 and buy a domain name. But that's it. Okay. And the more members we get, the more assets I can add. One of the things that we're adding for brothers and sisters who are on their spiritual path are guided meditations, spirituality enhancing frequencies, 
If you are on your health journey, we're going to be sending out a monthly package of um, herbal teas. I'm a big supporter of African herbal teas, so we'll be sending that out to you. But we can only do that if we get support from you. So go to panafricanlines.com forward slash VIP. Become a member today, today so we can cross that thousand member threshold and start really making a change in our community. So let's get into um, the only reader listener email I'm going to do today, not only because I'm excited for the guest and the information she's going to drop, but because this is going to be a longer response. So one of the brothers named Chief Chukwu wrote, quote, is there any consensus on unifying Africans via a common language? Are there any think tanks or study groups to currently research this to propose and advise viability and implementation of a unifying official tongue? My own limited research indicates that Swahili is the simplest for English speakers to learn. Also, there are now portable, powerful, instant interpretation devices. Any consideration on how these may be utilized to incorporate the 2000 plus languages spoken upon the motherland? I hope you all understood that. And here is my response with regard to the powerful instant interpretation devices and tools that you mentioned. I use Google Translate. I use Google Translate. In fact, I'm talking to some family members in Brazil right now in Brazilian Portuguese, which, of course, I do not speak. And we're coordinating our efforts to open up an entire part of the Pan-African Alliance website to Portuguese speakers in Brazil. So we're about to have a Afro-Brazilian section at the Pan-African Alliance. And so you should be using these tools to coordinate with other brothers and sisters overseas. You may think that Africans are far more enlightened than we are when it comes to the matters that we discuss here, but it's just the opposite because Africa, as I've said in the past, is ground zero for white supremacy. Things aren't much better in the Caribbean. And if you live in the Caribbean, if you're from the islands, the West Indies, as they're inappropriately called, you know that to be true. So there's a great awakening happening, but it's happening outside of the United States because we are just a little bit further along and Canadians too. We're just a little bit further along than our brothers and sisters, which means we have a responsibility to use these tools to reach out, to start understanding their cultural perspective and adding the knowledge and the resources that we have to the cultural, cultural integrity that they have, creating a unified movement. No, so speaking of a unified movement, the brother asks, is there any consensus on our common language? Are there any think tanks or study groups? So come back in time with me, family. You had the Berlin Conference in the late 1800s. This is where all these white supremacist nations came together and they uh, did what they called the partition of Africa. They divided up the African continent. They drew borders amongst themselves, unbeknownst to the Africans and said, okay, uh, France, you get Mali, uh, Belgium, you get the Congo, uh, the UK, you get Ghana and South Africa, Germany, you get Namibia, right? And so they divided up Africa They cut it into pieces and divided it amongst themselves. So when our people found out about it, and of course the brothers and sisters on the ground knew nothing about what was happening, but those of us who were living in these white supremacist nations at the time, we all caught wind of it and we said we needed to do something. We've got to coordinate our efforts. And so this ultimately led to the rise of organizations like the UNIA, um, the NAACP, but that's, that's a different subject. I ain't going to touch on that. One day I'm going to have to do a full episode on the NAACP uh, as far as I'm concerned, an illegitimate organization when it comes to our people's needs and Pan-Africanism. And so one of the people who decided to take action was a man named Henry Sylvester Williams. He organized the first Pan-African conference and that was held in 1900. And it's when all of us came together and we decided what we were going to do to respond to this new threat. So these congresses, these conferences, so initially they were called conferences, later on they'd come to be known as congresses. They were designed to make sure that we were all on the same page, moving as a unit and responding to this new threat that is white supremacy. And they were designed to be convened regularly so that we were always on the same page, so that we didn't forget what was talked about at the last Congress and we carried forward our action items and were accountable for what we said we were gonna do into the next Congress. Right. So these are your Pan-African Congresses. And over the years, you had attendees like Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, W.B. Du Bois, uh, uh, representatives from the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, Marcus Garvey's Association, although Marcus Garvey never attended. And I can understand why, because the NAACP tried to have him assassinated with the help of the government. But that's neither here nor there. Right. 
Um, but you had all these illustrious attendees. And at the fifth Pan-African Congress, which was held in Tanzania, this subject came up for discussion. They wanted to know if we should have an official language and they agreed on the language that we should be speaking. They understood what I parrot, what I repeat, and that is that one of the biggest barriers to African unity is our language barrier. If we can't communicate, we can't coordinate. Somebody write that down somewhere. If we can't communicate, we can't coordinate. And so thanks to colonization, Africans are divided into English speakers, French speakers, Portuguese speakers, Creole, indigenous language speakers, right? But when we look at other cultures that are thriving, we see that one of the foundations of their success is that all members of that culture speak the same language. Let's take China, for instance. Before China became the oldest empire still in existence today, and it is, its early emperors had to unify the people under one language, and they did so through bloodshed. And before Islam dominated the African continent, which it has, its culture, which is Arabism, demanded that all members speak Arabic. Now, look at the African diaspora. Look at what happened in Cameroon recently. I'm sorry, what's still happening in Cameroon? And if you're not familiar with this, Cameroon is divided between English speakers and French speakers. Literally, the French speakers are slaughtering the English speakers. Ironic because you have Africans from two different European cultures killing each other. Y'all see the irony with that? Y'all see how ridiculous it is? But I say it's ridiculous, but I'm not saying that flippantly. These are deep issues that we've got to solve as a community. All right. We've got to solve for miseducation, which is defined as the cultivation of an alien identity. It's one of the weapons of white supremacy and um, uh, uh, colonialism. We've got to solve for integration, which is when one's culture comes to resemble that of another's. And the only way you can solve for that is if you reintroduce those members to their original culture. When we see Portuguese speaking Brazilians, they struggle to express solidarity with what's going on in the Congo because of the language barrier. And when we see black men and women enslaved in Arabic countries, they're powerless to tell anybody about what's going on with them because they speak Arabic and we don't. So what was resolved at the fifth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania? was that if the African diaspora were to unify under one language, all 1.3 billion blacks around the world would no longer be isolated from one another. As an organization and as a movement, it has been determined. It is no longer up for debate. It has been resolved. So we don't have to keep doing this work over and over again. We don't have to keep answering the same question over and over again. It is resolved that our official language is Kiswahili. I got the receipts on why that is, right? So give me a second. But this is a language that's spoken by more than 140 million people in Africa and around the world. And here are a few reasons why. Number one, this is an easy language for English speakers to learn since pronunciation is similar to that of English, right? So that's important. Because if a tonal language like the Yoruba language was used, right? Which by the way, if you wanna learn Yoruba, learn Yoruba in addition to Swahili. If you wanna learn any other language, learn it in addition to Swahili, okay? So, so again, it's easy for English speakers to learn, but here's why that's important. English, Portuguese, German, French, Italian, and Spanish these are all what are called romantic languages and romantic languages, languages that were descendant languages of, uh, I guess, the, the Roman Empire are all spoken in similar ways. They're all spoken in the same way. In other words, if I used a tone that doesn't change the meaning of the word, whereas if this was Yoruba, changing the tone gives you a completely different word. Now, there's a benefit to learning tonal languages, but for the purposes of practicality, 
Languages like Kiswahili are easier for us to learn. There are many words that English and the Swahili language have in common. We're going to talk about that in just a second. And on the African continent, the Swahili language shares similar pronunciation and vocabulary with many local languages. African people have been divided by language and Swahili has the power to unify Africans globally. It's easy to learn. It's already being spoken across a vast swath of the continent. And even our brothers and sisters on the continent who don't speak Swahili. Remember how I broke down English, French, Italian, Spanish. All those are romantic languages. Well, key Swahili and many of the other languages on the continent are what are called Bantu languages. Now, you might have noticed that we use the word Swahili and Ki Swahili interchangeably. In case you're wondering, there is a difference between Swahili and Ki Swahili. Now, here's the difference. The prefix Ki, okay? So when we say Ki Swahili, the prefix Ki means language of. So when you put Ki in front of Swahili, you end up with the language of Swahili. Swahili describes the culture of the people along the East African coast. So Ki Swahili is the language that those people speak. So even though we use the word Swahili and Kiswahili interchangeably, if we're talking about the language alone, then we use Kiswahili, okay? Now there's a debate in our community about using Kiswahili, and that is it came from Arabs or Europeans. This is not true. And I'm gonna get into this in just a second. But the reason why you find so many Arabic or European languages in the Kiswahili language is because the people of the coast interacted with foreigners and some words and phrases from Arabs and uh, what we call Mzungus, whites, those were added. But many African scholars have shown that the Swahili language came from a mixture of much older, pure indigenous African languages. Now, there's a debate in the community and everybody will say, yeah, but aside the word Swahili itself is an Arabic word and they're right. Swahili is an Arabic word that means coast. But before Swahili was called Swahili by the Portuguese or Kiswahili, this language was known as Kingozi. Kingozi. This is before the 18th century. And so the appropriate name for this language is Kingozi. All right. So I mentioned that Kiswahili belongs to a larger family of Bantu languages. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include a link in the show notes. Go to this link and check out this map. And you'll see just how big a portion of the African continent speaks a Bantu language. Where do these languages come from? How did we end up with uh, Kiswahili? All right. Again, let's go back in time. All Bantu languages came from the western coast of the continent. On the complete opposite side where you find a lot of Kiswahilis today. Near present day Nigeria, Cameroon, but somewhere around 2000 BC. Swahili ancestors moved into that region and then moved from the west coast into the central regions of the continent before arriving in the Great Lakes of the Eastern African continent area. And that's where they set up permanent settlements. We have anthropological evidence that corroborates this. For instance, if you are reading Baba Ifa Karate's book, The Handbook of Yoruba Religious Concepts, he talks about the arrival of the first Yoruba empire builders and they came from Kemet. And when they got there, when they got to the region of Yoruba land in Nigeria, they displaced a lot of the older groups that were there because this was a superior culture coming out of Kemet, obviously. And that's what happens when a superior culture meets a culture that is less refined. Displacement happens. Which is why all of Northern Africa is Arabic. All right. Which is why we're sitting here in the United States. For those of us here in the United States, speaking English, our culture was destroyed. We were integrated into the dominant culture. So around 2000 BC, you have the arrival of the uh, Yoruba culture displacing many of the older and less refined cultures in that region, including the Nak culture. And then we see this culture combining with the arriving dominant culture, learning from them and using what they learn, particularly when it comes to weaponry, to sweep out over the African continent in what's been called the Great Bantu Migration. And today you hear the language spoken in Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, the Congo, Zambia, and it's the most widely spoken African language. You can't say that about Yoruba. Can't say that about other languages. So when we combine those facts, the fact that it's easy to learn or easier than tonal languages, more people speak the language or a language similar to that language on the continent, and the fact that by and large, this is a pure indigenous African language, then it is resolved here as it was resolved at the fifth Pan-African Congress 
that Kiswahili is our language of choice. So the best way to learn Swahili if you're a beginner is with an introductory course. You need to learn from somebody who is a native Swahili speaker, Kiswahili speaker. And so I've been um, I've been working with the course for the past couple of years that's taken me from being a beginner to a fluent speaker faster than any other course out there. I don't I don't like the apps. The apps are incomplete. Sometimes you can't hear the words. I've tried to learn on YouTube, but it's not organized enough for me. I like to learn in an ABC format, not not having to jump around YouTube videos. You feel what I'm saying? So there's a course that we found very, very cheap. Go to panafricanalines.com forward slash Swahili and check it out. It is a super learning course. They use background music to tap into brain waves that'll help you focus, relax, and embed the lessons in your subconscious. This is what's called a long-term memory method. And if you think this is bullshit or spookism, do you remember the Kit Kat theme song from the commercial? Sing it in your head. You see what I'm saying? That commercial hadn't been on for years. When was the last time you saw that commercial? But you still have that stupid jingle in your head. 17 minute languages uses the same technique. And that's what I recommend. Go to panafricanalines.com forward slash Swahili and um, take the course if you're not a member. If you are a member, panafricanalines.com forward slash VIP, you're about to get this course for free. I'm going to buy it and I'm going to upload it and you'll have access to all the modules. All right. So become a supporter. And, you know, if you're not if you're not able to become a supporter, um, you should be learning another language anyway. Right. That should be one of your academic goals. And there are some great reasons why. Um, Learning a second language makes you smarter. The process of becoming bilingual exercises your brain. It challenges you to concentrate. It boosts your problem solving skills. And all these are important factors when it comes to intelligence. It improves your memory. Learning a second language is important, as I mentioned already, for black unity. So this is something that all of us should be engaged in regardless. I'm not telling you not to learn other African languages. Learn them in addition to Kiswahili. Now, there is a caveat here, and that is the comedic language. I, um, I advise all academics in the black conscious community to also learn the comedic language. And here's why it's going to give you a deeper and better understanding of other African languages. Earlier, I drew the relationship between all these European languages. They all fall underneath the umbrella of what are called romantic relation, uh, romantic relationships, psych, romantic languages. Right. And so. When we're talking about the Bantu language, when we're talking about Wolof, when we're talking about all these languages, they all share a common ancestor in the comedic language. OK, if you have read uh, Civilization or Barbarism by Baba um, Chekanta Diop, he gives you similarities that are found in the Dogon languages and the Wolof languages. Wolof is spoken in Senegal and the comedic language. And so just as learning Latin gives you a better understanding of the English language or French language or Germanic languages or any of these romantic languages, learning comedic will give you a better understanding of the Bantu languages and all these other language groups on the African continent. OK, but that answers that email. Chief, thank you so much for writing us. For those of you all listening, make this one of your goals. If we can't communicate we can't coordinate and we can all agree that unity is one of the biggest problems that we face as a community. So by learning this language, you're doing some good for yourself and you're opening up the lines of communication across this global village of Pan-Africans, right? So we're going to take a short media break and on the other side, we are going to come back with our main segment, rolling out the red, black and green carpet for our esteemed guest, Ray Queen. When you look at me, what do you see? Now, I'm going to go through some of the things that I typically hear. To the very astute, I usually get I'm black, I'm bearded, and I'm strong. I also get I look like NBA superstar James Harden. I'm most definitely the poorer version. I get hip hop superstar, Emmy Award winner. Donald Glover, a.k.a. Childish Gambino. Yeah, that too, right? <laughs> and last but not least, I get Curtis Jackson, a.k.a. 50 Cent. 
Now, one of my goals is definitely to get rich or die trying. I think Sally May is putting the emphasis on or die trying, right? But see, what I don't hear is, Phil, you look like somebody that lives with depression and anxiety. Phil, you look like somebody that was suicidal for 15 years every day, five to six times a day. They don't say, Phil, you look like somebody that was driving on Interstate 95, wanting to crash your car to end your life. No. Because see, here in America, when we think about mental health, we think about the homeless man who's walking the streets, talking nonsensically to himself. We think about the, the white celebrity who takes their life via suicide. We think about the, the white mass murderer who goes into a high school and takes the lives of innocent children. Or it's usually your president who loves to tweet venom from the hip. But see, rarely does the conversation speak of a father of two kids, someone who possesses a master's in exercise science, a master's in social work, somebody pursuing a doctorate. Rarely is it a person of color. Rarely is it a black man like myself until now, because black mental health matters. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is black mental health, and why is it differentiated amongst racial and ethnic lines? Black mental health are the individual and collective experiences that influence the wellness of a community. Trauma is the biggest influencer of black mental health. We're talking about historical trauma, slavery, Jim Crow, the civil rights movement, the Tuskegee experiment, up until present day trauma, when you see somebody that looks like you get killed in their home. Rest in peace, Botham Jean. When you see somebody who's living with mental wellness issues get killed by the police. Rest in peace, Laquan McDonald of Chicago, Illinois. Or when you see somebody that looks like you get killed by somebody that looks like you. Rest in peace, Triple X, Tentacion. See, when we talk about trauma, trauma is unique to the individual, and I'm no different. There were three impactful, traumatic situations that I've experienced in my life outside of the genetic predisposition because my grandmother lived with schizophrenia. I hearken back to being in eighth grade, 13 years of age, on the way to school. My mother has a nervous breakdown. She's crying, she's pulling at her clothes and her hair, she's cursing. I felt helpless because I couldn't help her or I couldn't, and I couldn't help myself. And see, I was expected to continue to go into school that day and achieve. It's funny, when I, when I first started telling this story, I told my mother, listen, I'm telling the story of when you had a nervous breakdown. And she said, Phil, that didn't happen. Now, I know I'm getting older, I have a few grades, right? But I swear I remember that. And then she called me a week later and she said, Phil, I didn't know you remembered that. As if I wouldn't remember the most traumatic situation that I've experienced in my life. And that typically happens. We're often expected to just continue on because we are so resilient as a people, because we do survive and we've survived for hundreds of years. And I was expected to survive and go into school that day and perform. And I did. Because, like many of us, I learned how to suppress my emotions and my feelings. But what if I didn't? What if I went into school and I started arguing with peers and fighting? What if I started arguing with the teachers? What if I did criminalistic behaviors within the community? Would I be deemed incorrigible and unable to be in the school setting, in the community setting? Or would anybody care that I just experienced this traumatic situation that has impacted me? Fast forward to my 12th grade year, 17 years of age, January 2001. My mother said, Phil, come downstairs. She said, Phil, your brother Bobby died. And I started crying. That was probably the only healthy coping skill that I had at the time, right? Because being a product of the hip hop culture, Hip-hop tells me when somebody dies, 
you either go out and get some liquor or you go get a rest in peace tattoo. Well, I wasn't old enough to drink. That, that would happen once I got to college, right? But I went out and I got this rest in peace tattoo. As if that was going to do something, if that was going to take away the pain of losing a primary relationship, it didn't. And people ask me, Phil, well, how did your brother die? Say, the opioid epidemic is, is popular now. But in the black community, in the hip hop community, especially amongst black male, it's always existed. He was one who liked to use codeine and Xanax. I don't know what he was trying to cope with. I will never know. I went to school that Monday because I didn't have anybody to say, Phil, stay home. Because my mother was, was going through it because she just lost her only child. And I went to school feeling all of this emotion. And I remember it like yesterday. I was sitting in computer class. Miss Williams, my computer teacher, came up to me. And I don't know what she said. She said, Phil. She could have said, Phil, what was the score of the Eagles game last night? I let her have it. I blacked on her. I cursed her out. Why? Because I had all this built up anger, all this built up rage. But, because see, when we're talking about depression and anxiety for black men especially, it doesn't look like somebody laying in bed for six and seven days on end. No, it manifests itself through anger and rage. I ended up getting suspended that day. And Ms. Williams and I were able to laugh at the situation years later because I was able to cope with it and understand what I was feeling. But again, it was a moment in time that impacted my life. My third and final story happened at Bloomsburg University in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. Again, we remember traumatic situations, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I call it the Jew story, right? Because when I go fill out job applications and it says, have you ever been convicted of a crime? As long as it doesn't say misdemeanor or felony, I can, I can ignore it if it says that. But if it says, have you ever been convicted of a crime, I have to check it off, and then I put, well, it all started with a cup of juice. And then the employers, they laugh, like, oh, 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 man. And I laugh, like, ha, ha, ha. That's my life. So the juice story is, I was coming from the gym to go get me something to eat. I got my food. I paid for it. Emphasis on pay. And you know how you go to McDonald's, they give you a cup, and you can go to the fountain and get whatever drink you want. And I did that, and I tasted it to see, water, see if it was watered down. But see, when you go to a predominantly white institution like Bloomsburg University, it seems like they have all the minorities' names on a list. And she, the school police officer said, Phil, that's stealing. Mind blown. And me having this anger, this frustration that's built up over years of trauma, and me not being able to express myself in a healthy way, I blacked on her just like I did Miss William, Williams. Unbeknownst to me, that would lead to 20 plus charges. I ended up going to jail that night. I ended up getting expelled from school. I ended up doing a weekend in jail because, listen, they say you'll get judged by a jury of your peers. With the average age in that community being 60 and over, it wasn't going to be a jury of my peers. But I needed that experience. I needed it. And I, I, I needed it because it told me that, Phil, I have to do something different. I ended up appealing to get back into Bloomsburg University, and people knew me, so people wanted me back. And so I got back, and I was focused. One day, my psychology professor, Dr. Cambone Camara, God bless the dead, he said, Phil, come talk to me about anything, anytime. And I took him up on that. I went and talked to him, not to talk about school, I went to talk to him about a young lady I had been courting, right? And I wanted to understand why didn't she want me? So I went to his office. I'm like, listen, I bought her sneakers. I took her to the movies. I took her to dinner. Well, my mom took her to dinner and all those things because I didn't have a job. Thanks, mom. <laughs> but he said to me, Phil, in life, you change to get something or to keep something about. Little did I know that that would become my mantra, that I realized I had to change. I had to work on my wellness so I can be whole. It took approximately 10 years, because that's the average length of time that they say somebody who lives with mental wellness issues, 
That's the time that it takes for them to come to grips with it and to seek treatment. For black people, I think it's much longer. And so within those 10 years, I've been on medication, which quelled the suicidal ideations there no more. I go to therapy every week. Hi, Dr. Val. It's been so critical for me in my wellness because I decided to go from living to thriving. To my black brothers and sisters, you too deserve to go from living to thriving. We no longer have to wear the mask. We're survivors. There's help now. We can get help and walk out there with our heads held high and get the treatment that we need so we can go from living to thriving. To my non-black brothers and sisters, will you now view the black person that you come in contact with and, and might be in a negative way and recognize that, you know what, they might have gone through something. Or to see them when they excel, what they had to go through to get to that point. Or will mental health continue to be viewed in America as Kate Spade, as Anthony Bourdain, as Chester Bennington, as Robin Williams? Would it now include actor Sam Sarpong, Lee Thompson Young? Will it now include 10-year-old Ashanti Davis, who took her life because of bullying, would now represent Emmanuel Sloan, who's the reason why I'm here, because at 19 years of age, he decided to take his life by jumping in front of a train. This isn't an indictment on you or on America. This is just a public service announcement that's stating that we're here and we deserve to live and to thrive. Thank you. All right, family, welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed that media break. And our guest today is the Harriet Tubman of Health. She is the author of The Secret for Sisters, The Black Woman's Spiritual Guide to Releasing Negativity. And as a certified holistic health practitioner, she has lectured on topics covering medical miseducation, emotional balance, and so much more. She leads weekly live stream sister circles that I suggest all our queens support. So it is with pleasure that I roll out the red, black, and green carpet for our sister, Ray Queen. How you feeling? I'm well, brother. Thank you for that amazing introduction. <laughs> Truly my pleasure. So before I get off on tangent and we get deep into some very, very important topics, uh, particularly as they relate to our sisters, but applicable to all of our people, why don't you introduce yourself and your platforms to the audience? Talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing and why. Okay. Well, I am Ray Queen. I am a metaphysician and a board certified um, holistic health practitioner. I am the founder of The Secret for Sisters and True Soul Food. And I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about both. Uh, the Secret for Sisters is a book turned into a community conscious group. So we are a self, spirit, and community conscious sisterhood designed to tap into our ancestral memories, to restore our womb wellness, and to reclaim our divinities as the original woman. And True Soul Food is an organization that has a mission of re-educating melanated people about what soul food really is. You see, we've, uh, we've adopted some of the practices that slavery forced us to participate in, and we've accepted that as an authentic expression of our culture, but that has been at the expense of our true authentic selves. True soul food is a bit of a Sankofa concept in that we must go back to our roots in order to move forward and to be healthy and to address the alarming rates that we are suffering from so many different diseases in our community. True indeed, true indeed. You mentioned being a uh, board certified holistic health practitioner. What is that mm -hmm. process like? What does that mean? What's the course of study entail? And what does it mean to be a, a holistic health practitioner? Okay, so um, I did receive a holistic health practitioner designation in 2011. And that is a, a program through Natural Healing College in California. It's a postgraduate uh, degree that required studying nutrition, um, herbal medicine, mind-body connection. 
and that was a two-year study. In addition to that, I did receive a PhD in natural medicine from uh, North Central University. Mm, Dr. Ray Queen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you you mentioned the mind-body connection. I didn't know mm-hmm. that, that was a part of being a holistic health practitioner because whenever I hear like board certified, board designated, I think, okay, Western medicine. This is someone who's yeah. licensed to practice medicine the way that the big pharma industries have mandated because we know that they have heavy hands across all of these uh, uh, medical practices, right? It's all about mm-hmm. the money particularly Mm -hmm. here in the West, not necessarily about the healing. So we were talking a little bit about this before our interview started. I don't think the West really respects that mind-body connection the way that we do in our community. So can you speak on that? What is that mind-body connection that you're talking about and how does this relate to overall health? Sure. So yes, and you're absolutely right. The the Western medicine is just now starting to include mind-body study. Like we've had, we have fields like neuroimmunology, and we already know about, you know, the placebo effect that's, that we've used in Western medicine for years. But a lot of the universities and medical establishments are starting to slowly but surely add, because the public demands it, add value to the mind-body connection in their, in their traditional medicines. Places like Kaiser Permanente um, actually have departments now for holistic practitioners that their Mm -hmm. clients can actually see in addition to their traditional doctors. And that's because there's such a demand for it from our people. And uh, minds are making them sick. Yeah, absolutely. And we've known that, like we, we all know that on some level, I don't think we've accepted it, but we all know that our emotions affect us physically. And so it's starting to get a lot more credence and the, uh, the process with that, the whole board certified thing, you know, I hesitate to say that, except for a lot of times our people need that type of verbiage to even listen to you, Mm. unfortunately. And so in order to get a platform, a respected platform, because my mission is just to get in. Once you let me in your door, then I can drop some pearls on you, you know, but Mm -hmm. in order to, in order to Mm -hmm. get into a lot of doors, I needed those credentials. I don't place much, much weight on them, but uh, you're absolutely right. It's, it's it's a struggle living in America with uh, mind body connection science. People's minds are absolutely making them sick. You know, about a year ago, uh, probably a little more than a year ago, I was suffering from uh, what I thought was, you know, early stages of a heart attack, which didn't make sense to me because, you know, I'm eating alkaline. I'm, I'm, I've always been very, very athletic and I couldn't figure out what it was. Went to the hospital. They couldn't diagnose me with anything. You know what I'm saying? And they had me hooked up to the EKGs and they were doing blood work and everything. I mean, they gave me a full extensive workout as if I was about to have a heart attack. And they're like, we can't find anything wrong with you. And so I was like, see, this is why modern medicine is BS. But it turns out that, yeah, it was it was it was mental. Right. It was spiritual. And after I went on a retreat out in Arizona, uh, I came back in radiant health because I learned techniques for better coping with the immense amount of stress that it takes to take on the system of white supremacy and wake our people up. So I think um, I think we all need to pay more attention to that. Sometimes, you know, it's not necessarily treating your high blood pressure with chemicals. Mm. It's treating your high blood pressure with light work. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. The light body, the the astral body, the light body is plays the most important role in our health, contrary to what Western medicine would have us to believe. True indeed. If your emotional body is not healthy, your physical body will not. True indeed. And your physical body will not be healthy unless your emotional body is well. So you have to address your emotional state. And I think you go in on this in your book, The Secret. So could you describe how our thoughts and our emotions are uh, driving forces in our physical health? Uh, And not just that, but how they're driving forces and manifesting our desires, manifesting our will, manifesting our intentions. Could you go in on that? Sure. So we know that science has taught us that uh, our feelings dictate every moment of our lives and thoughts manifest themselves. Right. So this is quantum physics. This is universal law. And the more energetically charged a thought is, the more powerful its magnetic force. And since we already know that all things are energy, um, our emotions are simply energy in motion. Mm. And our emotions are the fuel behind our thoughts and our beliefs, right? So the more passionately we feel something, the more vibrational pull it has. Now, 
this information is, isn't hard to digest. Most people get that. But the problem arises in the fact that we're not aware of our thoughts. We're usually not aware of what we're thinking. Most of us don't have any new thoughts, right? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we are simply rethinking the same thought over and over again. And those repetitive thoughts become our beliefs, if that makes sense. Mm. And so once a belief, once a, a thought becomes a belief, it operates from a subconscious directive. And I'm trying not to go too deep, but. No, they can, our, you know, our this audience is one of the can handle it. Why, they can handle it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of, this is why when people use affirmations, they say it doesn't work or when we say we want something different, but it never happens, that's because all of those things are conscious activities. But manifesting our desires is a subconscious activity. And so in order to uh, change our beliefs, we have to change our habitual thoughts. Mm. And that will be the driving force behind what you manifest in, in your life. So you have to become aware of what you're thinking, and then you have to put the the force behind it, the, the energy behind it with the right emotional faculties. Mm. And this works in both directions. So if the more positivity or positive thoughts you're putting into it, you'll manifest more positive things. The more negative th thinking you put into it, you'll manifest negative things, right? And a lot of us aren't aware of what's considered positive and negative. Anything that has the ability to cut off is considered negative. So when we use words like can't and don't and won't, it automatically cuts off the the vibration of positivity. If mm. That makes sense. So we have to become very conscious of our thoughts and make sure we put the emotion behind it. You mentioned that energy has pull. And uh, one of the things that I learned from you uh, and others in particular is that uh, when you are manifesting these negative thoughts, when you're manifesting these negative emotions, because there's something that you don't want, OK, let me let me just make this real and practical. Brothers and sisters are out there saying that I don't want to be broke. I don't want to be sick. I don't want bad things to happen to me. I don't want negative relationships in my life. Uh, I don't want all of these negative things. But that universal energy is, as far as I know, neutral in how it responds to you. And so if you are pulling negativity into your life by saying what you don't want, that's exactly what you're going to get. It's like um, mm -hmm. if you've ever rafted or here's a, here's a more practical way of thinking about this. If you've ever been driving and you've looked to your left or to your right, you'll notice that the car starts veering towards your left or towards your right, the direction that you're looking in. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at what mm -hmm. you don't want, that's exactly what you're going to veer towards. And so one of the things that mm -hmm. I learned from this book and your teachings is that by focusing on the things that you do want by manifesting that positivity, then you start veering towards that. So either way, you're going to veer towards what it is that you're constantly thinking about and what you're constantly feeling. So if you're coming from a place of lack, don't want, fear, Right. Uh, aggression, that's mm -hmm. what you're going to start manifesting and then you're going to get more of it. And then we get into that feedback loop that we were talking about, because while you have these affirmations for 30 seconds of your life, the other, you know, 23.3 mm -hmm. out 0.5 hours are focused on these negative aspects. You have any thoughts on that? I, I love your analogy about driving the car because that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And just pay attention to your word choice. Like you mentioned, if you say, why am I always broke? Broke is what the universe hears. Mm -hmm. And so you'll get more of what you're, what you're speaking into existence. So instead of claiming or being tired of being broke, instead speak on having plenty of money. You know what I mean? Just change your verbiage. But yes, your car analogy is amazing. And I'm going to use that. I've been working on my analogies. <laughs> <laughs> so you teach all these as uh, all these concepts as part of sister circles. And so that puts you in close proximity with some of the major issues that our sisters are struggling with and brothers, too, and brothers, too. Right. So for the brothers listening, uh, if you haven't already tuned out, I don't want you to think that these concepts are limited to the sisters. It's just that the sisters seem to be putting in a lot of work with regards to this, with regards to working together. Right. Some of you all may have noticed that all of our guests this season have been sisters and that is not intentional. It's just how things have manifested because I think um, our, we as brothers, we got some work to do in that regard, but neither here nor there. So you're in close proximity with some of the struggles that black women are facing. What are some things that um, 
are recurrences that keep popping up that you've seen across the 10 years that you've been doing this? And how are you addressing those? What, what, what kind of work do we need to be doing? Well, I think probably the biggest hurdle has been that we don't believe what we believe. <laughs> what do you, what do you, if that on, makes what, sense. Mm, <laughs> work with me. What do you mean? <laughs> okay. Let me, let me break it down for you. So it's almost like a cognitive dissonance, right? We, we've been taught to believe a certain thing, but we don't believe what we believe. So you don't believe in, you've been taught that premarital sex, for example, is wrong, but you're actively participating in premarital sex. Mm. So that means you don't believe what you believe. And so you have these morality meltdowns because you have these inconsistent thoughts and beliefs that are struggling for a place in your existence. Does that make sense? You with me? Absolutely. We flowing. Okay. <laughs> so when I says that causes anger, of course, that's how it manifests image issues. Uh, we accept things that we don't want to accept or we reject things that we should not be rejecting because we don't believe what we believe. And so in the work, we have to address our beliefs. Everything always goes back to our belief system. If you want to overcome any type of ailment or issue in your life, you have to first go to your belief system. And then you have to make sure that your beliefs align with your thinking and that you're not just regurgitating the beliefs that were given to you, that were handed down through, you, the, through the generations, through your family, through friends, examine where your beliefs come from and if those beliefs align with who you are today. Mm. So that's a lot of the work. That's the bulk of the work we do in Sister Circles. Mm. How does somebody examine a belief, right? Like, how do I know this is what I believe if it's buried so deep in my uh, subconscious? I don't want to say it's outside of my realm of awareness because we're all aware of it. We're living that awareness. But how do I know, okay, this is a belief or this is just a thought or, you know, how do we, how do, we do that, that kind of deep self-examination? Does it take someone else looking at us and pointing out things for us? Does it take um, some, some kind of metaphysical ritual? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And no, it does not take anyone else. You can always determine what your beliefs are by what you're doing. Your actions will always show you what you believe. Mm. This is why you see people who say, I, I'm a vegan and they're eating hamburgers and chicken twice a week. Mm. You're not really a vegan. Your actions will always tell you what you believe. So for, that's a very uh, simple example. But, you know, when you, um, like I mentioned earlier, your beliefs are habitual thoughts. It's something you've thought over and over and over again. And a lot of times it's not even conscious thinking. So for example, you may have grown up hearing things like money doesn't grow on trees. Your parents may have said that to you anytime you wanted to buy something. And so now without realizing it, those thoughts are still what direct your actions. They override your, your conscious mind and direct your actions. And so when you're doing the work, you have to, and this sounds weird coming from a holistic person, but you have to segment um, your life in categories so you can dig deep and go back into your childhood for most of us go back into your childhood examine your family dynamics examine your adolescent dynamics and find out what messages you were giving at that time and then you have to find out if those messages are contradicting or are they preventing you from manifesting the things that you want but you have to do the work and if you're saying i want to be rich but you're not coming rich is because there's a subconscious programming that you haven't dealt with yet. And so you have to do the work and just examine where your thoughts and beliefs are, came from. Mm. To me, that sounds a lot like journaling. And so as you were speaking, I was thinking about how to turn this into practical application. And so, um, you know, we teach our members to do time audits and to do what we call self-authoring. And self-authoring is kind of like a form of journaling, but we should go a little bit deeper by writing down our actions to identify our beliefs and then doing kind of maybe free flow writing on things that we were taught as a children, things that we felt, things that we experienced. And instead of journaling, like, here's how my day went, really doing deep dives into, into these topics. Is that what we're getting at? Yes. 
Yes, you become the watcher. And that's a concept Eckhart Tolle teaches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that he's neither here nor there. But becoming the watcher is very powerful. It was for me. And so, you know, a, a practical activity can be as you go about your day today, kind of watch yourself like you're in a movie. And when you do something, question yourself about it. Say, why did I do that? Because that's going to prompt and trigger the connection, the subconscious connection that you need to deal with. Mm -hmm. By just asking yourself, why did I respond that way? For instance, you why know, so am I? There's been many times where we respond a certain way and we don't know why. Or women get mad for no reason. Like, why are you mad? I don't know why I'm mad. Well, let's figure it out so, so we can deal with it. Somebody you know? figure it out. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> we have been there. We have been there. Brothers, this is why y'all need to tune in. Y'all need to be reading these books. You know what? I, I, I wrote an article <laughs> on the best books for black women. And um, I didn't just... BS my way through that article. I read a lot of those books, including yours, and it's to better understand our sisters, right? And for sisters to help them understand themselves as well. So, uh, so brothers, we need to be up on this knowledge, but back into it. Maybe you need to create a journal. Do you have a product like that already? No, uh, I have a chakra journal. I call it the chakra journal and it does examine some beliefs that's available on Amazon as well. Okay, cool. It's cool. called a Get your chakras together, but it's a journal. But in the books, in my books, I do have activities that will steer people in that direction as well. No doubt. No doubt. Well, it, we might edit that part out. You let me know if you want to keep it in, but I didn't want to drop, okay. drop something that didn't exist. Uh, but if you don't have one, yeah, definitely. But you do have one, so I'll definitely check that out. Okay, so okay. We're, we're talking about examining our beliefs, watching ourselves as if we're in a movie. Um so how do we start to align our beliefs with our actions and our thoughts? Because earlier you said that's a big reason for that emotional uh, uh, reaction that we experience. And uh, sometimes it's inexplicable, mm -hmm. but it comes from being divided into two selves. And I think we all experience this to some extent, right? So how do we start to align all of these elements of our being? Well, again, it goes back to your beliefs. Your beliefs are the driving force behind everything. And so once you've identified uh, where your beliefs coming from, you can replace those beliefs by overpowering the subconscious directives we have been given for so long. And so in order to say to wipe out an old belief, you have to replace it with a new belief that overrides it. So money does grow on trees can be an example of that. And by saying affirmations do work, even though it's a conscious activity, it will eventually seep into the subconscious if you do it long enough. When you start to treat money, like it does grow on trees, you begin to erase those beliefs. Spending money, um, knowing that money will come back like a boomerang instead of fearing, you know, giving from a, spending from a place of abundance rather than a place of fear. There's small things you can do in your everyday life to erase those subconscious directives. I think that's... That will help to align the beliefs. Actions. Absolutely. I think that's so important. Um, my day job I mentioned is uh, real estate investing. And any investor will tell you the money ain't the problem. The money's out there. There are, there, there are people sitting on mines worth of money, right? And I'm talking about locally. I mean, there are people who are very, very cash rich. That's not the problem. Finding the deal is the problem, right? Finding a good deal is, mm -hmm. is, is, is the real issue. And I just say that to say this, there's an abundance of everything that you want in this uh, near infinite mm -hmm. universe, right? There's an abundance of it. And we've been so programmed to, to believe in scarcity. And that comes from a number of places, right? It comes from Western culture. By the way, the definition of miseducation is cultivation of an alien identity. And so we are cultivating that alien identity that was forced on us as people of color. By the West, we are allowing ourselves to be miseducated. We're participating in our own miseducation, but that's a sidebar. Um, you know, capitalism mm -hmm. and economics is based on one word. Economics specifically is based mm -hmm. on one word, scarcity, right? And that's communicated mm -hmm. to us our entire lives. I don't have enough money for that, right? I'm not making enough money at work. And see, now we're pulling in those, 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 those negative energies. We're veering towards mm -hmm. that. And so it becomes true, right? Um, so I think that's, right. that's so, so important. Uh, just shifting gears a little bit. You also do work with um, food justice, food choices, food deserts. Uh, and um, there are also political forces that shape food choices that you've addressed. So could you talk about the relationship between these elements and what we've been talking about thus far? Okay, so yeah, true soul food, uh, 
like I said, it's, a, it's an organization that deals with melanated people and their food choices. And in my work with my people, it's been a struggle to get them to make extreme changes to their diets, even when they know that it's killing them. And so I've come to understand this from a psychological standpoint and that our people feel like they have a sense of betrayal when they denounce the food they grew up on. You know, how do you, how do you tell your mother or your big mama that the food she raised you on no longer works for you? It's a challenge. I've, I've come to realize that. And it's hard to do. It's almost like you're betraying your culture. And I'm not uh, a proponent of veganism, but when I do mm -hmm. ask my clients to go vegan just for a short time, because there are some benefits to just giving up animal products for a short while. Absolutely. It's met with a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance. They just, it's just so, it's, it's, it's a struggle. So true soul food has become a cheerleader for what we call deliberate eating. And deliberate eating is about making conscious and intentional food choices. We already know what foods are good for us and which foods are bad for us. And so when we eat deliberately, we pay attention to what we're eating and how much of it that we're eating as a gauge to determine what our next food choice will be. So every bite we take is either killing us or healing us. Take that with you as a deliberate eating eater. Every bite we take is either killing us or healing us. So if you consciously choose to eat more of the healing foods than the killing foods, our bodies will thank us and you'll see a decline in disease. Right. So that means you can eat your fried chicken if you want to, but you can't eat fried chicken every day. You know, mm. it's just you have to be conscious about what you're eating. Additionally, uh, True Soul Food acts as um, advocates for patients who have difficulty with their doctors and getting off medication. Um, we also address the political forces that shape food choices like food deserts, uh, corporate influenced government policies. And when I say that, I mean things like the, the overwhelming presence in inner city schools with the food like products because they're not real food, uh, media campaigns and the use of deceptive practices, primarily to, to uh, black people or people in the hood and other food injustices that are at the expense of people in the hood. Mm. And so what True Soul Food has done is we've been able to establish a few community gardens in a few different cities. And um, we've also acted as advocates for parents whose school lunch programs weren't up to snuff. And we actually have some school programs, some school districts around the country that require the students to eat the school lunch. That's ridiculous mm -hmm. to me. And so we act as advocates for that. Um, we've also petitioned and demanded that inner city stores have, um, they offer quality produce and organic products. And my new baby that I'm working on is we are, um, rolling out the Too Smooth Mobile, Too Smooth or Too Smoothie Mobile. <laughs> and then Too Smooth Mobile is just like the ice cream truck. And we're going to drive through um, food deserts and offer free. We're going to be donation based, but we won't turn anybody away and offer organic smoothies and juices and expose, you know, our kids and even adults in the hood who may not be familiar with a lot of these fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, the foods, the color of the rainbow that they need, because we need all of those colors um, to be healthy people. And we're going to drive through the hood, roll through the hood and just offer free smoothies and juices as often as possible. Now, see, that's what I'm talking about. So instead of like the ice cream truck or a food truck, you're doing a smoothie truck. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's what right. I'm talking about. A free smoothie truck. Now, if you can't pay, we'll take any type of donation. But if you don't, if you can't pay, no worries. You're going to get one anyway. Queen, you, know? you need to commercialize that thing and be right behind all those barbecue trucks and taco uh. trucks that are lined <laughs> up outside of those corporate <laughs> offices. Queen, you might be on to something. We might have to edit this out so nobody you. beats you to the punch. But <laughs> <laughs> you might be on to something. That is a absolutely brilliant idea. And uh, it's brilliant because as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, there aren't any vegan fast food restaurants that I know of. There's not a vegan drive through. And the reason why so many of us do uh, uh, choose those establishments, I don't because I am eating deliberately. Whereas I used to be an unconscious grazer, but you know, the people who are out there that are just unconsciously grazing, like I'm not hungry, but I might be hungry. I just want something that kind of has a crunch and a sweetness and a, you know, saltiness. And so you're in the fast food drive, you know, and mm -hmm. there are no convenient yeah. options that exist. So if, uh, if you start really hitting the road with these smoothie trucks, I think you would make a killing. Cause I hear the ice cream truck now and it's still like, it's 50 degrees. The ice cream truck is already out there. 
<laughs> like getting that money. Already filling our babies up with all kind of dairy products and MSG and pesticides and hormones. And then we wonder why they can't focus in school. You know, we and, wonder why they're diagnosed with so many mental health impairments. And it's just right. babies as young as four and three with cancer. What, what or, is that about? Or going you know? through puberty. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's crazy. It's exactly. crazy. I, 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 I would argue whether or not a child, by the time they've hit, you know, maybe 15, I'd argue whether or not 20 percent of their diet has been real food. Because when I, um, uh, mm-hmm. you know, early in the morning, you're driving by the kids on the bus stop and all of them have the hot Cheetos and the sodas and everything. And, know you know, it. the Arab corner stores, they open up early just to cater to these kids. And of course, the kids are packed in there. all that junk food. And then they get to school and they're eating fake foods. And then after school, they're, they're grazing. You know what I mean? And then maybe at dinner, which is sometimes the only real meal any family has together on the weekdays, you know, we're still filling our kids with all these excitotoxins and fake foods. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's something that we got to take into consideration too. You meant, you meant, you mentioned earlier some deceptive practices that are taking place on the part of these corporations with regards to food and medicine. Could you just go a little bit deeper into that? Because we do teach on weapons, such as mm-hmm. intoxication and infection. So what kind of deceptive practices is going on out there that we should be watching out for or aware of at least? Okay, well, the first one that comes to mind is how the government allows businesses, corporations that they're in bed with to use deceptive language on their packaging. And so too many times we'll go to the grocery store and we we're, we will think we're eating healthy because it says all natural on the label right. or something right. to that sort. And it's just because it's natural doesn't mean it's good for you. You know, cocaine is natural. You know? so. <laughs> right. Sugar is natural. <laughs> right. So they allow these deceptive advertising practices and people, I have clients who will swear up and down they're eating healthy and I'll take a look in their, their cabinets and it's full of all types of bad things. Another one is uh, MSG. I've now seen labels that say no added MSG. <laughs> Mm, so people think added. I'm not eating any MSG. Yeah, you just don't have any added. If they didn't put any more in it, but there's already some there in the product that they made it with, right? If that makes well, sense. What's what's wrong with MSG? Because I think a lot of brothers and sisters have started to glaze over when it comes to that topic. We've heard about it for so long, and people kind of know it's bad because there's been this this underground media campaign. But what is MSG? Why is it um, why is it so toxic? So MSG is a neurotoxin, right? That means it affects your nervous system and your brain and all of the metabolic processes in our body. And so if your body can't metabolize the things you're putting in there, it stores it. So mm. the metab- metab- metabolic process is designed to get rid of things because we all have things in our body that we shouldn't have. Toxins of some mm. sort from the air, from food, the things we put on our body. But when we metabolate correctly, we will get rid of those things. When we dis- disrupt the metabolic process, we accumulate all of these toxins and these toxins end up getting stored in various parts about the body, which is actually directed by our thoughts. So women who have breast cancer are directing their toxins into their reproductive organs, for example. And mm. the accumulated toxins harden over time and become cancerous. They become tumors. They, they manifest in these other forms of disease because your body cannot get rid of the toxins. Wow. All because of yeah. that mislabeled MSG on that package. So mislabeling yeah. is one of the big ones. Well, let me ask you this. If everything is mislabeled or so many products are mislabeled, how do we know that um, we're eating something that's legitimate? I mean, how do, how, do, how do we see through that mislabeling? What are some solutions based on what <laughs> you're doing with um, True Soul Food? I mean, what do we do, you know? It's hard. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's difficult. But I always tell people to, to buy things that don't have a commercial. Hmm. If they're trying to sell something to you, then there's probably something wrong with it. You, we've never, you very rarely, I should say, see commercials for kale or spinach or lettuce or apples or oranges. It's very rare that you see those type of commercials. And then the second thing is to uh, look, read the ingredients. You don't just read the front of the package where they're using deceptive practices. You actually have to turn it over and look at the ingredients on it. The, the first rule is if you can't pronounce it, don't buy it. But that doesn't always work because some of us can't pronounce some of the simpler things. If it has more than three or four ingredients listed, don't buy it. That means they've added something to it in an attempt to preserve it or refine it or something to that nature. So those are some good rules you can follow when you're shopping. 
as you were talking, I was thinking about those milk commercials back in the day. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Mm -hmm. I would always think like, why would you need a commercial for milk? People are going to drink milk anyway. And, Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that casein protein is a huge source of all kinds of dietary issues, all kinds of Mm -hmm. dietary issues. And I think Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other healers in our community, they would always say that we're the only animal that drinks the lactate of another animal, right? Mm -hmm. We're the only animal that drinks the lactate of another animal. And that can't be biologically right and exact. So yeah, I would think about milk commercials. I would think about all those kinds of commercials. Like who's, who's not drinking milk, right? Nobody should be drinking milk. And why do you have to say it does the body good? Right. It, <laughs> it absolutely doesn't. And you know what? It something does. else that I came across too was um, because as I was as I was tapering off of milk, as I was kind of re- weaning myself off of milk a couple of years ago, I would do like the low fat options or the no fat options. Turns out those are those are worse than the 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 the, the you know whole milk options because they use chemicals to remove mm-hmm. fat. Absolutely, just like the the, the, the knockoff sugars. You know, that aspartame and all that does far more damage than regular sugar, you know? How do you feel about raw sugar? A member asked me about this topic a couple of weeks ago. Is there a sugar sugar replacement that we can see? Go ahead. Stevia would be my suggestion. Uh, Stevia is a good uh, replacement. And uh, raw sugar is, is okay in moderation. Just don't do the white sugar. Don't do anything that's been bleached. You know, pastas breads, sugars, anything that's white, it ain't right. Just Be stay away people. from it. Yeah. It's bleached. It's just a little bit of common sense. If you just take a moment and think about it, instead of being propagated, like we've been advertised to so much, just take a minute to think about it. Why do you want a food that has been bleached? Because it doesn't come out of the ground that way. Grain doesn't come out of the pasta that, I mean, out of the ground that way. You know what I mean? Get it Indeed. in its purest state if you're going to eat it. True indeed. True indeed. So um, there are a couple of other issues that I think we we ran through, but I, I get so excited about all the topics that you cover in particular that I jump around. And um, some of those were the issues that you face dealing with black women. And of course, we talked about uh, emotion. We talked about alignment. Uh, we talked about all those things. But uh, based on what you've heard from other queens and yourself as a black woman, brothers, pay attention to this. As a black woman, what are some things that you wish black men knew about what the queens in our community were dealing with and how you all feel? Oh, that's a loaded question. Okay. I know. And about Um, everything, right? Like nothing in particular, (laughs) just everything. But uh, just just need some things that come to come come top of mind. Well, for me, I wish my brothers overstood that black women are victims. Right. We are victims of systemic feminism and racism. And that's created this, you know, that the morality meltdown I was talking about earlier, the cognitive dissonance in black women. And so they're trying to saddle, they're trying to live in two different worlds that are seemingly opposing worlds. Right. And that's resulted in ridiculous battle cries that we have. You know, I'm a, I'm a strong black woman. And uh, I don't need a man and these kinds of things, they they spout out. But those are defense mechanisms because they're not true. We definitely need a man. And Black women shouldn't be claiming being strong so much as recognizing their strength because being strong and having strength are two different things. And we've confused those over the years. And so the louder and more aggressively a sister shouts out these little mantras, the more victimized she is, the more pain she is carrying, the more internal conflict she's holding on to. And so Mm. it is in those moments when we're acting up the most, when we need our brothers to stand with us the most. Mm. And it's usually when they choose to leave from my, what I've discovered in sister circles, they start acting a fool. They start crying or talking crazy and the black man will get up and leave and maybe not come back. And that hurts. That digs the wound even deeper. Mm, I've done that. I've done that. You've yeah, got it was, my, it was it was my yeah, it was my number one strategy. As soon as, you know, we 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 started dealing with some uh uncomfortable issues, I would just leave. I would go for a walk. I would I would just bounce. And you know what? On the low, I did that because I knew it would hurt her a little mm. bit and I knew it mm. would affect her and I knew it would kind of get my point across like I'm not even willing to to 
acknowledge this situation. I'm not willing to be present for this situation. Mm. Um, so a little deep, a little deep into to, to a side, too deep maybe. So let's 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 come up out of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most difficult to st- stand there and stay, but I'm telling you that the payoff is going to be well worth it. You mm. know. Our, our, mm. One of our biggest fears, whether we know it or not, is uh, not having our man around, you know, and mm. sometimes we do things to push him away because we think he's going to leave anyway. And then if you leave anyway, you just validated what we thought in the first place. Because you there know? goes what we were talking about earlier, veering towards exactly what it is that you don't want. I don't want you to leave rather than let's do things to to make sure that we stay together. I don't want you to leave. So they end up leaving or you start creating situations that lead to that result. Is that right? That's right. That's absolutely correct. Hmm. Yeah. I was saying we both have to recognize we've both been victimized, you know, a lot of times because the black woman has been exalted in a lot of time, in a lot of instances in our society, because black women got a lot of the breaks that black men have not those types of things. A lot of black men seem to feel like black women have it easy. Like we got it all. We got all the breaks. And that's just not true. We're victims as well. You know, we have to gauge the rate, the racial terrain and the feminist terrain. And we've bought into this whole feminism thing from a Western perspective that is completely contradictory to who we are as original women. That is not mm. who we are as a, from a feminist perspective as African women, you know, mm. and that struggle. I'm telling you that, that that struggle, that internal struggle manifests in sometimes what it may appear to be, you know, in a bipolar <laughs> mannerism sometimes. That's real. Like, that's crazy, you know, but she's trying to navigate these different worlds as she's been told. She has to live in. That's beautifully said. And you know what? Um, one, one of the queens reached out to me and she said that uh, as black women, we are what we are because we've had to be. And I was right. That, that, that was in response to me asking her the question I'm going to ask you now. Black men, we see ourselves as victims of mass incarceration. We see ourselves as um, uh, uh, victims on a lot of different fronts. Right. And because of these um, weapons that have been used against us, we find ourselves lower on the socioeconomic scales, right? So you're a queen with a PhD. There's a brother out there who may, you know, might, might be feeling you, but he's not on your level, right? And he's not on your level for a number of reasons. And so I think brothers see that as a dividing factor and our sisters have too. You know, I don't know if you remember that show that I think ABC or one of these channels did where there were a bunch of sisters on talking about how they can't find a black woman who a black man rather who's on their level. And so now they're starting to date outside of their race because, you know, as you matriculated through college, you're surrounded by other white men, a- Asian men, other men, and you don't see black men. So could you speak to that? How do black women feel about the difference? Because black women right now, as far as I know in statistics that I've read, they're the most educated group in the United States. Black women are starting businesses faster than any other demographic in the United States. And brothers feel like that's creating a little bit of a divide because it's like we're all left behind. How you feel about that? Well, do you feel like you and, and do you feel like, see, we're getting off on one. Do you feel like you're stepping down by dating a brother who may not have your credentials? Oh, absolutely not. In fact, I've never dated anybody who, who's had my credentials. Um, I've been married, but I'm divorced. And But he was, uh, he barely got out of high school. <laughs> so mm. that's not even a requirement. But I think that Black women have, have, have a history of equating what they do with who they are. You know, and it should be that way, except for we're in a Western society. And so just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're aligned with who you really are. Right. Mm. Your years of study, your degrees and all of that in a perfect world, in a perfect African world would be for the benefit of other African people. But see, we're stepping outside of that paradigm. So all that you studied and learned is not for the benefit of your of your people. See, what I do is for the benefit of my people and with the deep respect for my people. And so degrees and titles. And that's why I hesitate to even tell a lot of people about my degrees because it's not important to me. Like I've done it so it can open some doors. I need it open, but it's, it's not who I am. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm an original woman who loves her people. That's all you need to know, mm. you know, and I operate from that space. But I do know sisters who take that approach and they feel like 
now that they have a master's degree and whatever, they need to find somebody who has the same thing. And then they find these brothers who have that and they're sorely lacking in so many other areas. You know, they, they don't have a, a, an affinity for their culture. You know, they're not treating them right. There's a, a long list of other things that comes along with just trying to mate with somebody because they're your educational equal. And that's just an illusion. It's all an illusion. You know, some of the most educated people I've met weren't people with degrees. They were self-studies. Mm, very you know? true. Very mm. true. I think that's a good place to punctuate this interview. I don't think I've heard a better, clearer and more heartfelt uh, um, uh, explanation of, you know, the approach that we should be taking as a people as we deal with the socioeconomic changes than that. I think that's a good place to punctuate this interview. So, um, of course, before we wrap up, I want brothers and sisters to make sure that they are supporting you. So uh, we are going to do a book giveaway. But before we do that, what are some ways that our brothers and sisters can get in touch with you? support your sister circles. I think, um, you know, we're going to talk about working more closely together to bring all the sisters in our organization uh, into your circles. So what are some things that you're doing that you would like to see our community support? Absolutely. So uh, in addition to purchasing any of my books, which are available on the website or at Amazon, I am excited to announce that we are planning our national sister conference. Uh, Black women from all over the country are going to meet in Denver, Colorado, which is my hometown, October 18th through the 20th of this year. We are going to spend an amazing two days attending workshops, connecting to our cultural selves, building sisterhood, healing our wombs, uh, doing things like comedic yoga. We're going to do some yoni steaming. We're going to learn how to make our own yoni steams. Um, And we're just going to connect and respect our innate spiritual divinities. So uh, we are in the process of developing the agenda, and it's almost uh, finished, finalized. But my sisters, you don't want to miss that. We're going to have some healers, some spiritualists, some comedic yoga teachers, motivational speakers. All are who all are um, original women, dynamic Black women, and they're going to join us to uplift us and to build us and to enlighten us. You can register for that conference at thesecretforsisters.com. You can also find me at rayqueen.com. I do a lot of speaking at uh, wellness, health and wellness conferences and things of that sort. And that's ray, R-A-Y-E, queen.com. And the secret for sisters is secret for spelled out S-I-S-T-A-H-S is how sisters is spelled. And of course, if you're walking, exercising, driving and listening to this and you can't remember um, all, all, all of those different links, we're going to include them in our show notes page, along with steps on how you can win a copy of Secret for Sisters. Right. It's uh, there's going to be three steps. And look, family, for those of you all listening two two things real quick. Number one, we all get excited when we bring on guests and the top of your head is tingling and you're like, you know, she's dropping some real knowledge and I'm definitely appreciating what y'all are doing over there. But it's not enough for us to verbalize our appreciation, to leave a comment, right, to, to, to clap it up and to share it and to give it a Facebook life, like rather. We need real support. And so uh, buy a book and then let her know that you bought it. Right. Follow her on social media, support her work financially and let her know that you're doing so. So that way, those brothers and sisters in our community who are producing see that the community is supporting them. They have your support. Right. In real ways. We're not uh, we're not trying to build a new church where there is a pastor or a minister who preaches and teaches. And then there's the audience. Right. And then you all go about your business. No, we're in the work of changing lives. So that's number one. And number two, uh, for you, Ray Queen, since this interview is going to be live for years to come, and I'm going to make sure of that. After the event happens, if you live stream it or if you have recordings that you can play back for brothers and sisters who um, or sisters particularly after the event has happened, let us know and we will update. We'll, we're going to update our show notes. And uh, we'll include links to how brothers and sisters can see the event happening after it has happened via live stream or recordings, if that's something that you decide to do. Now, is this going to be an annual thing, you think? Or yes. Are just going to see how the first one goes? You no, know, it's annual. It's going to be. I've done it before, but it was under a different name. So this is the first time it's under Secret for Sisters. So, yes, it's an All annual. Right. Mm-hmm. 
beautiful, beautiful. As time goes on and we build a more solid relationship together, and I hope we can, uh, we will always be updating our show notes page with everything that the queen has going on. And again, you can follow her on social media. Hit him, hit him with the social media accounts again. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at uh, Ray Queen or at The Secret for Sisters, two different pages. You can also find us at The Secret for Sisters on uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter. Family, that is a wrap. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. And if you want more podcasts like this or free resources that we provide as a community service, make sure you join our email list. Go to panafricanalliance.com forward slash subscribe. And if you're ready to take it to the next level with Black Business Builder tools to launch and build your website and your side hustle online, more than 900,000 premium WordPress themes, instrumentals, high quality video effects and intros. If you want access to the five elements mastery course, the keys to black consciousness course, secret podcasts, PDFs, and an opportunity to connect with a much larger community, then go to panafricanalliance.com forward slash VIP and see what we have to offer. Become a paid member. We absolutely need your support. In the meantime, remember our Pan-African code of conduct to do no harm to your own people Help your people when they are in their time of need. And above all else, hold the line, hold the line. As Khalid Abdul Muhammad always said, hold the damn line. And I will build with you all next time. Abibi Fahodiyeh.